Instruction on the Seven Elements The Element of Earth Look at the element of Earth, which ranges in size from the great Earth to a tiny speck of dust. Split this speck, which is near to nothing, and reduce it to the finest moat on the extreme border of form. Then split it again, and it becomes the void. Ananda, if this moat can be reduced to nothing, you should know that form comes from the void. You now ask about material changes which you attribute to the mixing and uniting of the four elements. Take, for instance, this moat, which is nearest to the void. How much voidness should be mixed and united to produce it? But it is absurd to suppose that this can be done by uniting moats. Since a moat can be split and reduced to voidness, how many particles of form should be fused together to create the void? The union of form with form produces form, but not voidness, and the union of the void with the void produces voidness, but not form. Form can be split up, but how can the void unite with form? You do not know that in the Tathagata store both form and its opposite, the void, arise from self-nature and are identical with each other and that the element of earth is fundamentally pure and clean, embraces all in the Dharma realm, and manifests because the minds of living beings know and distinguish between things in accordance with the laws of karma. Ignorant worldlies wrongly attribute this to cause, condition, and the state of the self as such, because their consciousnesses differentiate and discriminate without their knowing that the language they use has no real meaning. The Element of Fire Ananda, fire has no ego, but exists because of external causes. When people in a town are about to prepare their meals, they use mirrors of polished metal to obtain fire from the sun. Ananda, about your idea of mixture and union, take this community of myself and twelve hundred and fifty bhikshus. Though the group is one, each member has his own body, clan, and name, like Sariputra, who is a Brahmin, or Uvilva, a Kasyapa tribesman, and you, Ananda, who are of the Gautama clan. Ananda, if fire comes from the mixture and fusion of the elements, when a man holds a mirror to obtain fire in the sun, does this fire come from the mirror, the moksa, or the sun? Ananda, if it comes from the sun, it can burn the moksa in your hand. If so, all the trees will be scorched. If it comes from the mirror, and then lights the moksa, why does it not melt the mirror and burn your hand? But if you do not even feel the heat, how can the mirror melt? If it comes from the moxa, why does the latter require the sun and the mirror to make it burn? Look at the mirror held by the hand, the sun up in the sky, and the moxa which originally came from the ground. How can fire travel elsewhere before coming here? Moreover, the sun and the mirror are a very long way apart and cannot mix and unite with each other. Finally, fire cannot exist by itself. You do not realize that in the Tathagata store both fire and its opposite, the void, arise from the self-nature and are identical with each other, and that the element of fire is fundamentally pure and clean, embraces all in the Dharma realm, and manifests because the mind of living beings know and distinguish between things. Ananda, you should know that the fire is produced wherever a man holds a mirror in the sun, and that if mirrors are held up throughout the Dharma realm, fire will spring up everywhere in accordance with the laws of karma, and not in a given place and direction. Ignorant worldlies wrongly attribute this to cause, condition, and the state of the self as such, without realizing that it is because their consciousnesses differentiate and discriminate, and that the language they use has no real meaning. The Element of Water Ananda, water is unstable by nature, for it either flows or is still. Great magicians in Shravasti, such as Kapila, Chakra, Padma, 
and Hasta obtain water to mix with their medicines by exposing a crystal ball to the full moon. Does this water come from the ball, the void, or the moon? Ananda, if it comes from the moon, which is a very long way off, it should pass through the trees in the forest before reaching the crystal ball to flow into the bowl. If it does not flow through the trees, this shows that it does not drop from the moon. If it comes from the crystal ball, it should flow regularly, and not only when the moon is full. If it comes from the void of space, which is boundless, it should flow everywhere, submerging everything between earth and heaven. If so, how can there be living beings to walk on the earth, fly in the air, and swim in the water? Think of all this again. The moon is in the sky, the crystal ball is in the man's hand, and the bowl is in front of him. So where does this water come from to flow into the bowl? The moon and the ball are a very long way apart and cannot mix and unite with each other. It is absurd to say that this water does not come from any source. You do not know that in the Tathagata store both water and its opposite the void arise from self-nature and are identical with each other, and that the element of water is fundamentally pure and clean, embraces all in the Dharma realm, and manifests because the minds of living beings know and distinguish between things. Thus water flows wherever crystal balls are used to collect it and if they are held up throughout the dharma realm it will flow everywhere in accordance with the laws of karma and not in a given place or direction ignorant worldlings wrongly attribute this to cause condition and the state of the self as such without knowing that it is because their consciousnesses differentiate and discriminate and that the language they use has no real meaning the element of wind Ananda, the element of wind, has no substance, and either moves or is still. When you join a gathering and adjust your robe, the hem occasionally brushes the person next to you, disturbing the air which fans his face. Does this wind come from the hem of your robe, from the void, or from that man's face? Ananda, if it comes from the hem of your robe, the latter should leave your body to brush the man's face. As I preach the Dharma here, my robe does not move. Where can you find any wind in it? It has no hidden place where wind can be stored. If the wind comes from the void, why does it not fan the man when your robe is still? Moreover, the void is permanent, and so should be the wind. Then, without the wind, there would be no void. You can feel when the wind stops fanning, but what indication can there be when the void ceases to exist? If the void can be created and destroyed, it cannot really be void, and if it is, how can it create the wind? If the wind comes from your neighbor's face, it should also fan you. Then why does not your robe, when brushing against him, fan you back? Look into this carefully. The robe which you adjust is yours. The face fanned is that of another bhikshu, and the void is still and does not move. Then where does the wind come from? The wind and the void differ, and can neither mix nor unite, while the wind cannot exist of itself without a cause. You do not realize that in the Tathagata store, wind and its opposite, the void, arise from self-nature and are identical with each other that the element of wind is fundamentally pure and clean and embraces all in the dharma realm and manifests because the minds of living beings know and distinguish between things if ananda you move your robe a light wind stirs and if there is similar movement throughout the dharma realm there will be wind all over the world in accordance with the laws of karma and not in a given place or direction Ignorant worldlings attribute the element of wind to cause, condition, and the state of the self as such, because their consciousnesses differentiate and discriminate without realizing that the language they use has no real 
meaning. 